Well, good afternoon. Let's, let's make a, a start for the session. I think we've found all of the, the people that we're going to find uh, who might be wandering around looking for this room. My name is Philip Anderson. I'm Senior Manager in the Financial Advisory and Banking Department of the, the World Bank Treasury. I head up the group that is organizing this forum, so it's a, a particular pleasure to welcome you all to this session on um, asset liability management with a focus on managing currency risk. The topic itself is of particular interest to me. Before I joined the World Bank, I headed up the New Zealand Debt Management Office. And we used this approach quite a bit uh, to help us manage risks on the government of New Zealand's balance sheet. But having said that, I, I think uh, in my years here at the World Bank, I've observed that um, the topic of asset liability management is perhaps talked about more than it is actually implemented uh, in countries. And I think there are a couple of reasons for this. One is uh, an informational problem. Not many governments have a comprehensive view of their balance sheets. Comparatively few uh, produce a full balance sheet as part of their financial reporting. And another perhaps more important reason is that the various assets and liabilities on a government's balance sheet are managed by different entities. And those entities have been given autonomy for their specific tasks. And there are some very good public policy and governance reasons as, as to why that occurs. So I think that uh, that is, is an issue. Nevertheless, the objective um, of asset liability management is as valid for governments as it is for private sector entities such as financial institutions when it comes to risk management. Um, you know, simply stated, what you're doing is matching the financial characteristics, interest rate risk, currency risk, of one side of the balance sheet with another uh, to contain those risks, look for opportunities for immunization and undertake hedging. And that can be applied at, at various levels. At the most conceptual level, uh, thinking about the government's sources of revenue when you're considering the composition of debt uh, can give you insights into uh, exposure and particular risks, especially in crises. It can also be undertaken at a, a, a more uh, micro level, uh, looking at uh, discrete pools of financial assets uh, and debt. So one area where countries have been successful in applying this uh, technique, asset liability management, uh, has been in the area of managing currency risk. And I, I think that's partly because uh, it's tractable from a, an analytical point of view and you have the tools uh, available to actually uh, hedge that risk. Um, a number of countries ha have undertaken it, and we'll, we'll hear from, from some in a minute. Um, I've seen it most frequently applied to the composition of foreign currency reserves relative to foreign currency debt. Uh, we did this in New Zealand, and a number of other countries have in whole or in part over the years. And I think over the last decade, the issue has become uh, much more relevant because we've had a, a long and growing list of countries, particularly in the emerging market space, that have bu been building up pools of financial assets, uh, particularly accumulation of foreign currency reserves. So to talk us through the issues and provide us with some practical examples, we're fortunate to have uh, three great speakers on the panel today. So first up will be uh, Ib Hansen, to my right, who's Special Advisor at the National Bank of Denmark, responsible for international financial stability and stress testing. He's had the benefit of working both at the Danish Treasury and the, and the Danish Central Bank, so a good vantage point to consider ALM issues. After we've heard from Ib, we'll hear from uh, Fatosh Koch. Uh, to my left, Fatosh is Head of Market risk management department at the Turkish Treasury, where the core of her work is supervising the development of the government's uh, benchmark borrowing strategies. 
Uh, she was involved in setting up the risk management unit at the Turkish Treasury over a decade ago, so has had a, an extensive uh, uh, career of experience in this area. And our third speaker will be Harry uh, uh, Setiawan, who's Deputy Director, Ministry of Finance in, in Indonesia, and who's working on a, a very interesting project there in terms of asset liability management, which we'll talk about. So without uh, further ado, I'll hand it over to Ib for the first presentation. Well, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Philip. It's a great pleasure for me to be here to introduce um, how we have approached asset liability management in Denmark, although, as I'll show you, it has been kind of going up and down. Uh, we have a fairly consistent framework, we think ourselves, which has been implied now for more than uh, 20 years. Uh, so it has a, a long history, and we nearly don't think about it anymore uh, as such, for reasons I will come back to. As Philip said, uh, as a liability management, that's a little bit like motherhood and apple pie. It's very good. Um, uh, and if we look at financial institutions, it doesn't make sense if they don't look at the asset liabilities. If we look at um, if we look at um, corporations, non-financial corporations, they also look at the asset liabilities to a large extent. But that's not always the case uh, for um, sovereigns. And I think the, the, this chart from the background note shows it very um, clearly. There's a lot of different items on the asset and liability, and as Philip said, every item basically has a different governance structure. So there's no, at least in most countries, there's no institution where we actually collect the numbers together and, and find out what is the exposure and which can are, are accountable, accountable for that. Most items, if we look at the currency reserves, as mentioned up here, if we look at the debt, if we look at the, at the financial uh, of, of the real um, assets are managed in a separate environment and, and there's some institutional framework to handle that. So it's, in that way it's difficult to, to, um, to look at it on an integrated basis. Also, if we look at um, the whole accounting setup, it's kind of difficult to, um, it has at least challenges to, um, <coughs> to really uh, implement as a liability management uh, source because most government accounts are on a accrued basis, while if we want to look at asset liability management, we have to take into account the market value. And the market value really doesn't fit into the kind of constraints that the Ministry of Fund Treasury are, are, are faced with. If, if some assets are getting much more expensive or higher priced, that can be used for public uh, goods or public expenditures. So it's difficult to translate the market value to, to real public constraints. Also, if, if rating agencies are looking at a country, they probably don't care so much about the, the actual market value of asset and liabilities as uh, the, the current account. So market value is not inherent into the way that we think about, um, about um, public finances. I know New Zealand, you tried it, but, but it's difficult to implement it fully. Also, some of the at least uh, when we tried in Denmark to look at asset liabilities, uh, we found that some of our tax revenues are very sensitive to interest rates, so that, and that is very difficult to put into a, the, the bigger picture in a consistent way. So it is difficult in many ways, but, um, but at least in our case, we have, um, we have tried to look at it on the currency risk perspective in order to um, achieve some goods. Uh, we cannot make a wholly kind of a unified theory for everything, but we can look at the currency. And that, we think, has been a very big uh, benefit for, for Denmark. If we look at how we, um, the framework that we are working in in Denmark, um, in Denmark the, the kind of underpinning of FX debt and FX reserves are the Danish currency policy, where we pursue a policy 
which has been pursued since 82, of having a stable exchange rate against euro, and before euro it was against the uh, German, the D-mark. So we pursue a, a policy of uh, fixing the exchange rate against the um, external target. So in order to do that, that cannot be done by, it's the task of the central bank to actually implement the policy on the currency market, but the central bank cannot do that by itself. Firstly, we need to have a macroeconomic policy in order to, to kind of facilitate this policy so that it makes, makes uh, sense. But we also need to, from time to time to make interventions on the currency market, and the only way the, the central bank can get currency for that is by the government issuing government FX debt and putting it into the, to the central bank uh, reserve. So we have had for many years a, a policy so that the, the foreign debt is used for financing the foreign reserve. It's not used for financing deficit. So all deficit should be financed uh, with domestic issuance and then if there's need for more foreign currency in the reserves, we will issue more foreign debt. If there's too much foreign reserve or, or if we can reduce the foreign reserves, we will use that to repay government debt, FX debt. But there's a clear separation between domestic and FX debt. And that's kind of one of the underpinning of why it's, at least in our case, a little bit more easy in perhaps other cases. So if we look at the, at the objectives of the central bank and the, and the debt management office, um, w there's different objectives in the two cases, but, but there's also some uh, uh, common ground, uh, and, and the objective of the central bank is to, f to fix the uh, exchange rate um, and also to have financial stability. On the debt management side, the, the purposes to finance the deficit and finance the reserves and having a low risk um, and uh, a number of other reasons, other objectives, which is fairly common. So we have these two parties, uh, but the nice thing in Denmark is that um, from 91, 1991, the government debt management was moved to the central bank. So. The debt management office is actually part of the central bank. Uh, it issues debt on behalf of the kingdom, of the treasury, but it, uh, it does that in very close cooperation uh, with the central bank. So in that way, that's one of the, some of the institutional underpinning of the East that we can do this with. The treasury has the overall authorities, but they are generally not kind of the outgoing um, party to that. So if we look at, um, at, at the FX risk of, of Denmark uh, until we started to do something about it, we have this. This is a short version. There will be a longer version in a short time. But in this uh, chart you can see uh, the calculations of the gains and losses uh, on currency alone in uh, respectively the, the central bank and in the government account. Um, I don't know, now I'm, you don't have to be familiar with Danish um, exchange rate, but, but if you have 10 billion Danish kroner, uh, that's a lot of money. At this time, it was perhaps 1% uh, of the Danish GDP or more than 1% of the Danish GDP. So that you can see here that, that the gains and losses every year on the asset and especially on the liabilities were very large indeed. And it made you wonder, at least it made me wonder whether that was really necessary. Of course, we should always be able to take on risk if it if it's, makes sense, but we shouldn't take on risk which doesn't make sense. So we need to have a purpose when we take such big risk as this was, as these numbers shows us. Uh, they reflected the, the fact that the government was issuing debt mostly in, in dollar, uh, 
and the central bank was uh, having some dollar uh, in its reserves, but only a, a smaller portion, and most had in European currencies. So basically, the government was borrowing a dollar, and the central bank was investing in in the uh, Deutschmark or European currency. And we need um, just to make a small to show a little bit about why we need the reserves is that we keep a stable exchange rate versus, in this case, the euro. You can see here the fluctuations of the of the Danish krona against the euro, and you can see the band, which is 2.25 percent. So this shows that we have a very, a very, um, we are very kind of particular about tracking the, the exchange rate in Denmark. And that goes even uh, through the Lehman case, as we have over on the right. Uh, but the, the thing which is not so fixed is uh, interventions. So we sometimes make very large interventions and sometimes very small interventions. But we always keep the Danish krona at a stable level. So we always need to be able to, to borrow if we need more money and to re and, and repay it if, we are, if it's possible. So you can see here, if we look at the, the Lehman case, um, we had to intervene a lot. The, the bar shows the intervention of the central bank. So if it's bar, the bar is negative, it shows that there's an outflow of currency from the, from, the, um, from the reserves. While the bar is positive, it shows that we can buy back some of the currency. But you can see that we need to be able to borrow FX in order to to uh, maintain our <laughs> currency policy. So that's why it's really one, two sides of one coin, the, the FX reserves and the foreign debt. So we need some ground when we are looking at uh, what, what type of risk do we want to take, <coughs> and what kind of risk do we really want to manage, and what kind of risk are we not able to manage. When we look at that, it's very useful, it has been in our case at least, to uh, distinguish between two types of, uh, of currency movements. Um, the first type, which is uh, if you have a foreign debt, you cannot avoid having the risk that your own currency goes up and down. That's um, unavoidable if we have FX uh, borrowing or in the case of reserves when we have FX reserves. Uh, the interesting thing here is to, uh, to try to understand how can we minimize that risk? What, what does this really reflect? How can we measure the risk that our own currency goes up and down? In principle, it, should be, it could be the, the risk against a risk-minimizing basket of currencies. And, and uh, we found that it's kind of not so obvious to find that in most places, but at least in our cases, we found that it's, that's basically the euro or the Deutsche Mark before that. So our risk minimizing portfolio would be a, a portfolio which is only consists of, of uh, euro when we look at it now, and before we could, it could be Deutsche Mark plus a little bit of additional uh, European currencies. And then we have an other part of currency risk, which is risk against the, the, the risk minimizing portfolio, which is a risk against um, all, all other currencies going up and down against each other. And that risk is basically how large that risk is should be based on some kind of risk reward trade off notion if that is possible. But it's, it's quite, um, for us it has been quite useful to try to be very uh, precise on what kind of risk is unavoidable and what kind of risk is actually avoidable and what and is, a, is a reflection of a, a, a risk reward trade off. It's not always very easy to, to, to do this exercise, but, but at least in our case, it has been very useful because we have this firm anchor so that we consider euro as the least risky 
currency. So why do we really want this um, as a liability management? We think that, that given the way that we have we are set up, it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to have a, the current the, the government borrowing in one currency and then the, the, the central bank borrowing in a different currency. If that's what we are doing, it kind of even though the, the government or the debt management office will try to kind of get the cheapest possible funding and the reserve manager will try to get the absolute best return, everything, all their effort would be swamped by the fact that there's a huge mismatch in the currency. We could see that was what, what happened before we tried to, uh, to coordinate where we can see this is a very simple um, kind of example where we can see that the, the government if, if it borrows in um, if the government borrows in dollar and the and the um, and the central bank uh, borrows in uh, invest in euro then what will end up oops. okay we'll end up really having a, a very uh, kind of not matching the asset and liabilities and we'll have a huge risk compared to if if they're both either in dollar or if they are in the, in the euro. So what we really want, if, if we want to borrow in dollar, we want the central bank to invest in dollar, and if it's in euro, we want to do it in euro. If we don't do that, the country as a whole carries a, a huge risk uh, on that. So that's what we want to do. It could either be in euro, dollar or we could be in euro. So. What happened is that um, that in um, 91, many years ago, uh, um, the, the debt management f uh, function was shifted from the Treasury to the Central Bank. But the Central Bank, as I said, is, a, is not <coughs> borrowing it in its own name, but it's borrowing on behalf of the, of the Kingdom of Denmark. And one of the reasons why the, the, the debt management office was moved to the central bank was actually in order to, um, to be able to manage the FX risk on a consolidated basis. There was a report from the National Audit Authority in Denmark which audited the, the government books and they pointed out that, it would, that the risk was excessive. Um, and they did that... Um, yeah, because they hired a professor to look into that, and the, the professor asked me, and then the report came out this way. So that was um, a nice impact. Um, so since 1991, we had this, um, the, the debt management office has been in the, in the central bank, and uh, the way it's set up is that every quarter there's a meeting between the central bank and the treasury, where the strategy is decided, and the strategy is then decided for the coming quarter, and it's based on a <coughs> proposal by the central bank. So the treasury is not kind of in a position to to make proposals. Uh, they, in generally, they are the ones who know the actually need for financing, which cannot be challenged by the central bank. So we have to finance, of course, the deficit. That's part of the agreement, um, but how it's financed is generally done um, after a proposal uh, by the central bank. And that also guides um, the FX debt and the FX composition. So we have a, a quarterly meeting where the, the FX, meet, FX is decided. But that has, um, and, and to support that, before we had the euro, we used um, some kind of some models. We, for instance, had the, a mean variance model, <coughs> where we tried to to describe the risk and reward seen from a Danish perspective. This is, uh, as you can see, from um, from the numbers and from the the, the and from the currencies is uh, from before the euro, 
because that's the most interesting story here. You can see here that, that the, the risk is on the horizontal axis and the interest rate is on the, on the vertical axis. And you can see that, for instance, the dollar is a very, very risky currency from a Danish perspective. It had, at this time, it has an annual uh, volatility of 10 percent, and that's actually one of the most consistent results that we have, is that the annual volatility of dollar is still about 10 to 15 percent uh, over the last 20 years, basically. So it is very, very volatile from a European perspective, while the European currencies are much less volatile, and that is our risk-minimizing portfolio. So we need a lot of um, faith in, in a falling dollar if we should have some uh, dollar debt. And that was also the result of this uh, exercise. So if we now look at the, the, this chart again, but with a longer perspective, you can see that, that uh, the gains and losses for the central bank and the and the government, they tried to be smaller. They started to be smaller in the late 80s when we started to reduce the dollar debt. Um, and then in 1991, we started to coordinate. And you can see that even though we have large gains and losses on each of the items, they basically net out with each other. So we have a very large gains and losses but they need out for the government and for the central bank combined. But, but then the first year of coordination, we, we tried just to look at the combined result, uh, which was kind of very stable. But, but it showed up that we didn't like so much to have very big losses and very big uh, gains on, especially the losses on either the central bank or the government. So we started out a new policy where we both had low risk on a on a kind of on on a combined asset liability management asset liability uh, viewpoint, but also in each asset and both asset and liability had a much smaller risk. So that uh, succeeded very good. Uh, so we had a very much smaller risk, and then the euro came along, and everything basically collapsed so that we could have this uh, net management by just having a policy of issuing debt in euro, if it was FX, and, and having foreign reserves in euro too. So we both have a small risk when we look at the central bank and the government each and also combined. So in that sense, our asset liability management co collapsed to a very easy uh, framework. Having said that, I should say that, that even the, uh, though I said that we have a, a very low, uh, only have debt in, in euro, we also issue debt in, in dollars from time to time, and, and, but that's then swapped back to euro. So even though we have dollar issuance, we have it only exposure in euro. That goes also for the FX reserves, where we have large dollar holdings, which we need in order to maintain financial stability in Denmark. But we then have uh, forwards, which will change the exchange rate uh, risk to, uh, to euro. So basically, this shows very good, I think, that it has been beneficial for Denmark to reduce the risk, both on the, on the liabilities and on the assets and on the combined, uh, on the combined uh, position. Perhaps I should then turn a little bit, because that's the next question we usually get. What about the, the, um, the interest rate risk? Can we also manage that in a consolidated basis? Um, that is not easy, and we have found it impossible, I would say. Um, <coughs> basically, one basic fact is that, that, the, that the government and the central bank look at risk different ways. For the government, Long maturity debt or long duration debt is have a low risk, while short debt has a high risk. Uh, 
for the central bank, uh, we have mark-to-market accounting, full mark-to-market accounting, and everything goes through the income statement, and that means that long debt Long assets will have a high risk, and short assets will have a low risk. So it's difficult to combine these two um, factors. What we try to do is that, that we try to combine them in a way that, that we don't do things which are really, really kind of stupid, like borrowing in one current in a, in a very long uh, maturity and then investing it with a short. But that's, um, that is a challenge too. But we try to keep a tap on that. But it's not so easy. So, if I should kind of conclude, we think it's, uh, it's a full integration of the, of the national or the government balance sheet is not possible and it's probably not wanted anyway. Uh, but we can pick some. Uh, elements and, uh, and make reasonable uh, arguments for, for integrating the management in a sensible way so that we actually um, avoid doing what you would say would be real stupid things in our case. But one should also point out that there's a lot of challenge in the institutional framework. We have been very um, fortunate in Denmark that it has been possible to to uh, integrate the management in the same institution, even though the books are different, and also that the, that that the kind of suggestion for this this came from the national audit authorities, which are very powerful in Denmark. So we basically had to do it, uh, but it was um, it has a challenge, and it's not easy to do it uh, in the same way in all places. Well, thanks, Ib. I I took one very useful guiding principle out of that, which is take on risk when it makes sense, uh, but don't when it does not. <laughs> I think that's a, a pretty good guiding principle for, for debt management. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, I think it, it uh, certainly gels with what I've seen in a number of other countries that have gone down this, this path, um, including in New Zealand. The objectives are the same, the outcomes are the same, but the, the mechanisms, the precise tools that you use, uh, and the institutional arrangements may be different. Um, uh, Denmark does stand out in having consolidated uh, this work within the central bank. Let's, um, let's keep the questions in discussion until after we've heard all three speakers, because I think we'll get some common themes emerging. So now I'd like to turn the floor over to Fatosh. Thank you, Philippe. Okay. Well, uh, today in my presentation, I will um, um, deliver an overview of uh, two country experiences, um, both of them emerging um, market country, Turkey and in South Africa. In, in both countries, uh, that management is part of uh, national treasury's responsibility. And uh, after uh, delivering an overview, I will um, <coughs> conclude uh, draw some lessons from those countries' experiences. Okay, I'll start with, before I start to, with uh, Turkey indeed, uh, I should uh, mention a survey uh, done in, um, by OECD. It's a joint survey, it was a joint survey done by OECD and uh, IMF in, back in 2008. Uh, this, uh, that survey um, run to um, to uh, gather some information about country experiences on uh, sovereign asset liability management. And uh, the results show that uh, the, the sovereign asset liability management uh, uh, practices vary considerably uh, among the uh, countries. Uh, while a few countries adopted uh, SALM in a comprehensive, integrated way, like New Zealand or Denmark, uh, some countries utilized um, SALM in, in a narrow scope, uh, together with Turkey, uh, countries like Hungary, South Africa, Czech, Czech Republic employ a relatively uh, narrow definition uh, of SALM, which takes uh, just some part of the uh, financial assets as well as the debt stocks into account when designing um, debt management strategies. So uh, with this um, information, uh, I will uh, proceed to, to Turkish example. Um, 
Maybe you have heard about our um, significant well, this uh, big uh, financial crisis in 2001. After the, that uh, financial crisis, uh, our debt management um, has undergone a structural reforms process. And uh, part of this um, reform process, we adopted a uh, sovereign asset liability management approach in, the, in debt management. It's a kind of practical approach in a sense that uh, we set up uh, debt management strategies, um, policies considering the risk characteristics of, of, of government's main financial assets and liabilities portfolios with a view to help reduce government's overall, overall, risk, uh, overall risk. So um, in practice, uh, financial assets and liabilities uh, in the mandate of uh, Turkish Treasury are considered in designing, in, in, in modeling stuff, which are um, cash reserves and receivables, um, naturally central government debt stock, and contingent liabilities. Well, when it comes to um, currency composition, um, we examine the sovereign assets without actually uh, examining the, the values, measuring the values. We look at the nature of those cash flows. And what we saw is that except foreign reserves, sovereign assets are mainly denominated in, in Turkish liras. And uh, the cost of borrowing is often, often higher than the return of, of, of foreign assets. So um, these valuable insights um, and assessments <coughs> lead us to, uh, to think about reducing the share of uh, foreign currency denominated debt. So that has been the main priority of, the, uh, of the, uh, our uh, debt management strategy, is to minimize the exchange rate risk. So, um, based on this um, strategy, um, Turkish Treasury has no longer issued uh, foreign currency denominated security in local markets since 2010. And the share of foreign currency borrowing in total has been reduced to 10% in 2014 from, uh, from the level of 33% in 2002. Well, uh, why we do this, uh, we, we um, adopted the natural uh, hedge approach rather than uh, on using uh, derivatives. So Treasury doesn't make use of derivatives to change its, uh, its uh, portfolio composition. Also, I should mention that uh, our debt sensitivity analyses are regularly conducted and reported to high-level uh, debt management committee. In these analyses, we, uh, we move from the conventional debt sustainability analysis to, to uh, risk-based um, DSA analysis. And uh, we uh, look at uh, contingent liabilities and um, the, the currency exposure uh, of, uh, of debt stock in the long term. And um, we, don't specific, we don't have specific benchmarks for currency composition. Um, however, uh, foreign currency composition is guided um, <coughs> considering the correlation between local currency and uh, major foreign currencies. Um, so uh, we borrow in a currency that has a strong correlation with Turkish lira. Currently, our um, debt co uh, foreign currency composition, when we look at that, it's um, most of like 70% of the uh, total foreign currency debt in, in dollars, 30% of in euros, and rest of it uh, in the Japanese yen and, and other currencies. So uh, let me talk about the results a little bit. This uh, chart shows us the currency composition of the central growth debt. As I said, back in 2002, we had this very high ratio of, of foreign uh, currency debt. It was uh, around uh, almost 60% of the debt that uh, was in foreign exchange rate. And uh, since we uh, followed that uh, debt management strategies to, to minimize the currency <laughs> risk, we, we reduced the uh, currency, ris uh, currency um, foreign currency borrowing. And now uh, our um, when, when we look at the, the, the portfolio composition, the share of foreign currency that is only 30% of the um, total debt. And this chart shows the public net debt stock as a, as a um, percentage of uh, GDP. Well, along the time, you know, when we look at the past 10, 12 years, we see the um, a major a significant change in the uh, foreign currency denominated net debt stock. It was uh, um, back in 2002. It was 
uh, I'm sorry, 30. 35% of, uh, of total GDP. And now we had a, a negative number which says that we have a positive um, net um, value in terms of net debt stock. Uh, well, I, I, maybe I should mention that uh, when, we uh, when we calculate this net debt stock, it's the, it's we deduct public, public sector financial assets uh, from gross domestic and um, foreign liabilities of public sector. Okay, it's, um, the second uh, country experience is South Africa. In South Africa, uh, debt management is uh, under responsibility of uh, National Treasury. And uh, within the National Treasury, there's a special unit uh, called Asset Liability Management Division. They are responsible for managing government's annual fin funding program in a manner that ensures prudent cash management and, op and optimal portfolio debt. And they also uh, promote and enforce the prudent financial management of state-owned uh, entities through financial analysis and oversights. So what they do is they don't, um, uh, they, their objective is not to match matching between uh, the financial characteristics of, of assets and liabilities, but rather provide a financial risk management guidance to um, government-owned companies. So when we look at the implications of uh, sovereign asset liability management for their currency choice, um, they minimize the foreign currency debt to, uh, manage, uh, to manage external <coughs> vulnerabilities. It was one of their um, main goals, as, as we had in Turkey have in Turkey, and uh, that management uh, has contributed to broader policy objectives, including reversing the country's foreign exchange reserve from a negative um, net position to current levels of, of, of positive levels, around 50 billion do US dollar. So, and when we look at their uh, risk benchmark, uh, they're very transparent, uh, and uh, their medium-term um, foreign currency risk benchmark is set um, at 15% uh, of, uh, of, of total debt portfolio. It used to be 20%, 25% of the total portfolio, so they, they uh, reduce the uh, share. And when we look at their, their results uh, in, in South Africa, they, they have this uh, similar uh, picture over there. It's uh, their foreign debt has been reduced. Um, significantly uh, well uh, from 19% uh, to 9% of, of gross debt. And then their composition is also very much similar to Turkey's um, foreign debt. 79% um, of the debt is in dollar and uh, like around 10% uh, in, in euros and the rest in uh, Japanese and other currencies. And the uh, government net debt stock. Um, as picture uh, speaks, it's in, in 2002, they had a, a, a higher level of net foreign debt, around 8% of GDP, and they managed to lower that uh, net debt exposure to uh, around um, low, um, um, below 2% of GDP now. Uh, when we look at this uh, two country experiences and, and the OECD survey, it's uh, both from vulnerability and a manageability perspective. Managing foreign currency risk exposure should be a priority from a balance sheet perspective. It's uh, the ma mismanagement, uh, mismatches in financial characteristics of uh, sovereign assets and liabilities imply a principle more vulnerability to financial risks as well as uh, efficient performance in terms of net worth of the balance sheet. So given the government's limited ability to generate foreign currency revenues, like in Turkey uh, or South Africa, an, un an unexpected depreciation of exchange rate deteriorates the government's fiscal position due to amplified debt service, obviously. And in terms of currency risk, sovereign asset liability ma management approach ad um, adopted by these two um, uh, debt management offices contributes to management of macroeconomic risks of uncoordinated monetary and, and debt management policies. and uh, it helps to build a more resilient sovereign balance sheet to, to currency fluctuations. However, well, besides the potential benefits, uh, there are key challenges 
of um, adopting a CLM approach in, in currency management. One of them is coordination and communication uh, with the central bank. As my colleague Abe uh, just mentioned, uh, they were lucky that you know uh, they, they, don't, they didn't have any coordination um, problem with the, with the central bank since they are part of the central bank. However, uh, well, foreign reserve management is usually well generally done by the central bank that operates independently from fiscal policy. The situation uh, can make successful cooperation on risk management more difficult since the objectives are quite different. Uh, and um, another issue that I would like to highlight is the institutional capacity. Well, uh, the risk analysis of the balance sheet calls for, for specialist stuff and uh, an advanced uh, technical capacity. And also operating active uh, hedging instruments like uh, interest and currency swaps entails uh, specific legal and IT system arrangements. So these are the practical challenges and management concerns regarding the, its uh, implementation. And, um, however, you know, new institutional arrangements may be founded in order to address those on those problems like uh, in in terms of communication and governance challenges um, you know new f um, special units uh, certain departments coordinating committees can be established to overcome this kind of um, challenges and also exchange rate, uh, risk on government debt and foreign reserves can be managed jointly without a specific need for modeling. What I'm trying to say is uh, that uh, when we examine the, the nature of the cash flows, uh, we, we gain useful insights about those um, um, portfolios. So um, as in Turkey, well, what we did is without actually measuring those um, portfolios, uh, we can uh, we can construct a, a natural hedge. Um, so uh, reducing the outright uh, exposure with passive hedging or active hedging instruments also depends on several factors, including uh, risk management in its capacity, institutional choices, and development of financial markets. Uh, but natural hedge uh, could be a good option in that sense. And uh, finally, the composition of, of currency, uh, foreign currency debt portfolio. It can be set either uh, by uh, considering the composition of, of foreign reserves or based on the correlation with local currency. What we did in Turkey is to we, we pick the um, currencies that strongly correlates with the with Turkish liras. Okay, uh, well, this is the end of my presentation. Thanks very much, uh, Fatosh. I think uh, two very good country cases there which have uh, extended the discussion to how ALM principles um, help shape decisions on the mix of foreign currency versus domestic debt and indeed the role that that can play in overall macro stability. Uh, let's now turn to, uh, to Harry to talk about the, the Indonesian case. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, World Bank to, for inviting me uh, to be here. Uh, and also, I think it's a big advantage as the last speakers, because uh, most of the <coughs> aspect already, <coughs> sorry, already explained by uh, the previous speakers. In this presentation, I want to share about uh, our study uh, not yet implemented. Uh, actually, uh, Mr. Ip, uh, Ip Hansen is my uh, our advisor, uh, so we learn a lot from uh, Denmark experience. So we use this. Yeah. This is the right one. The right. The right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think uh, why we uh, try to de develop the sovereign ALM, uh, the background is, uh, I think we are experienced many crises. Uh, the biggest one is uh, Asian crisis, 1997. Uh, Indonesia was uh, very badly hit. Uh, actually, uh, this is very relevant to this study because the uh, why we got the crisis is because 
we don't have a LLM at that time. Even uh, that management office is not there. So uh, at that time, uh, the monetary system, the exchange rate system, uh, back to uh, IDR, back to dollar. And every year, the central bank managed to depreciate uh, uh, IDR to US dollar around 5%. So because of uh, domestic uh, uh, interest rate is double digit, very high, uh, everybody borrow in dollar. Uh, so they taking account that with the 5% uh, depreciations, it's easy to uh, to re uh, repay the debt, and also at that time uh, the reserve is very small. I think it's around 15 billion, compared to uh, around 50 billion U.S. dollar for uh, government debt, not taking account the private debt. So, at, uh, that's very big uh, exposure in dollar. And one of the reasons is uh, the trend that uh, nowadays uh, SOE uh, gro uh, borrowing in FX uh, growth is very high. So uh, this is alarming for us because uh, it will uh, create uh, vulnerabilities in the uh, current account or, or balance of payment. It also will be risky for government because at the end it will be become a fiscal risk for government. And uh, when we talk about the sovereign ILM, actually the the horizon uh, we talk we talk is uh, about it's only for uh, for five years from. Uh, so it's initiated by IMF and World Bank missions uh, asking by uh, our ministry and central bank governor uh, to analyze uh, the balance sheet of government and central bank to get the, uh, basically to reduce the mismatch yeah, to, and reduce the cost of uh, monetary so uh, basically in uh, in the mission there are three uh, objective of the missions uh, one of the objective is uh, coordinating the management of fx reserve and external debt this is uh, quite difficult as uh, if uh, explained that because of uh, different objective between central bank and ministry of finance it's very difficult to coordinate uh, 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 managing uh, FX. And uh, the th third one, uh, the second one, uh, we already done the strengthening institutional role between government and BI, reducing uh, BI certificate and replaced by uh, government securities. It's already works. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, central bank use our uh, government securities for repos for uh, uh, auction yeah, for monetary option operations. The last uh, improving uh, cash management and debt management coordination. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, already done. Uh, we have a good coordination now. Because uh, in, in, the, in our ministry, uh, cash management is separated from the debt management. So uh, good coordination will uh, create uh, efficiency. This one. Oh, go back. Uh, Current condition uh, for FX uh, management coordinations. Uh, let's uh, we look at the uh, system. Uh, if we look at the bank in Indonesia, 
The main uh, job of uh, central bank, of course, is monetary policy, and one of the function uh, to do the monetary operations uh, to stabilize IDR exchange rate. Uh, it needs a lot of uh, reserve to do this because uh, IDR is one of the currency that very volatile. And also uh, FX reserve uh, for central bank, uh, there are three purposes uh, the, for liquidity, for safety, and for performance. And because of these three purposes, uh, basically the duration of the reserve is very short, yeah? uh, basically around two years. And there are interesting. Uh, uh, there is interesting aspect. The performance. It means uh, a return. So sometimes uh, central bank uh, uh, hunting for uh, high return in these trends. And also, uh, central bank uh, act as a government agent. Uh, it's act as uh, our. Uh, uh, provide a uh, facility for bond auction and pro uh, act as a uh, uh, bank for us. They pay, uh, uh, provide the payment uh, facility and uh, receive our deposit, government deposit. And BI operated based on BI law. And for government, uh, as usual, uh, fiscal policy and uh, collect tax, non-tax revenue, spending, uh, financing, and investment. And we issue government uh, securities, both in rupiah and FX. Uh, basically, we borrow a lot in FX. Uh, for example, last year we borrow around uh, 7.5 billion US dollar, consists of uh, uh, most of it is US dollar, and one of the new one is uh, Euro bond. Uh, government, uh, especially for uh, debt management, we manage uh, a portfolio, debt portfolio, uh, securities, and loan. Uh, we give on lending to SOE and uh, government operated based on state and finance law. Uh, while uh, state owned enterprise, most of the function is as an uh, agent of development. We have a huge uh, uh, lot of uh, state owned enterprise. The number is 138 now. Uh, I don't know, uh, it's changed uh, very often because uh, there is a merger and uh, a create new one. The, in this uh, sovereign ILM, we only taking account uh, the biggest exposure. Uh, in this uh, study, in this uh, uh, framework, we only taking account the Pertamina, this is a state-owned oil company. PLN is an electricity company. And uh, from uh, 138, we only uh, took six, uh, the biggest uh, exposure for FX exposure for SOE. These six already uh, represent uh, more than 90% of the exposure. Uh, so in this study, uh, our objective is to mapping the FX exposure condition of government and Bank Indonesia and SOE balance sheets. Also, the consolidated of uh, BI and government and all of the uh, balance sheet. Sorry, there is uh, still in Bahasa, it's mixed up. <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, 
And the second objective is analyzing the vulnerabilities on FX exposure of public balance sheet. Uh, we don't want to repeat the SN crisis, and because of that, we, we did this uh, study. And the last one, uh, the last one analysis uh, result will, will propose uh, portfolio management and it is uh, mitigation on public uh, FX asset and liabilities. An alternative framework on FX management, especially on the scope of government and BI balance sheet. Uh, we limited the scope into financial asset and liabilities. Uh, we didn't include the other asset. Uh, so, and for the currencies, uh, we took only three, the biggest one, uh, USD, uh, Japanese Yen, and Euro. Actually, this is more than 95% of the uh, currency composition uh, in the uh, debt portfolio. I think also in the central bank uh, asset. So only three uh, currency already represent uh, more than 95% of uh, exposure. And the risk uh, covered uh, at this time only mapping the net FX exposure uh, of uh, this each balance sheet and also the consolidated. The method uh, we use, uh, we use uh, actually because of difficulties to get the detailed data uh, because uh, as you know, the central bank is very hesitant to uh, uh, open all the detailed data. So based on uh, uh, site information, actually, we have discussion and we got the composition based on uh, indicative. So we use the indicative composition for uh, BI uh, uh, reserve here. Yeah. And converting all the currencies into uh, rupiah, denominated, denominated numbers. This is to get the, the same, uh, uh, to compare into the same number. And as uh, I said, uh, apply assumption for detailed breakdown of BI balance sheet. Uh, Um, we can look the, the balance sheet of government. Uh, government has a very small financial asset, basically because this for efficiency. We, uh, government only has 124 trillion. This is in trillion rupiah. Uh, as you know, rupiah has many zero. Uh, One dollar is equal to 12,000. So... In this uh, 124, for, uh, for the government balance sheet, uh, 2013, the asset is 124 trillion. It's mean only uh, around 12 billion. Uh, most of it in demand de deposit in BI, and on lending to SOE and cash in BI. While the liabilities is uh, around two, 2,371 trillion or around 200 billion US dollar, consists of bond, uh, 1,861 trillion rupiah and loan, 710 trillion. Most of our financing now come from uh, bond, uh, it's quite huge. Uh, every year, uh, we issued around, uh, including the refinancing, is around uh, 40 trillion. Okay. And uh, about the BI balance sheet, uh, it's contrary to the government balance sheet. Its BI balance sheet is more uh, has a bigger asset, uh, as all. Almost all in the FX, uh, 
uh, most of it uh, come from the reserve. Yeah. Uh, the securities is mean uh, like T bill, uh, UST bill, and bo uh, T bond, and um, most of it is G3 country. Yeah. While the liabilities, FX liabilities is uh, quite small, we didn't include the uh, money in circulation and other, other liabilities. We only took the uh, uh, special liabilities that connected to SOE and government. And also for SOE, a huge liability and small asset. So it's already represent uh, what's the problem. Uh, dig further to the data uh, for government balance sheet. Uh, look at the uh, middle uh, chart. Uh, the total exposure, uh, the, this is uh, mean the liabilities is bigger than the assets, so the exposure is positive or net exposure. The total exposure, if we look at the trend, uh, the development, for 2008, uh, still 700 trillion, uh, while in 2013, it's already 962 trillion the red one, the red line. Uh, but uh, this, some of the additional is come from the uh, currency depreciations. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the number of uh, liabilities is not uh, very big. If we look at the uh, right uh, chart, we can see that the government has uh, add more uh, debt in 2013. Most of it is come from the uh, bond, uh, FX bond. And if we look at the central bank, uh, the reserve is uh, increased quite uh, sharply. If we look at 2008, the reserve is still uh, around 50 billion. In 2013, the reserve is around uh, 90 billion. Actually, the 2012 number is, uh, in dollar term, is a uh, lot bigger than 2013, but because of depreciations uh, in 2013 is uh, bigger. And look at the uh, exposure uh, in the middle, in the middle chart. Uh, USD is uh, the biggest, uh, most of uh, reserve in USD. It's around 65%. And I want to show the interesting uh, one that uh, SOE, uh, uh, this is the the SOE uh, borrowing FX borrowing. Look at the growth; it's exponential. If it, in 2000X, it's still 107, and now it's already 332. Uh, this is because of uh, ample liquidity in the global market and also. Uh, the need for uh, capital uh, investment for SOE is very huge. And I think uh, I still have this uh, result. I think the with combining all the balance sheet, uh, we got the exposure is quite interested. It's interesting, yeah. Look at the red one, the total net exposure. In 2008, actually, uh, it's quite high, 375 trillion. Then it's going down. It's going down because of, uh, basically, uh, the reserve increased uh, quite a lot because of uh, 
a uh, lot of surplus for government yeah, for uh, current account because of commodity price is booming but after 2010 and 2011 uh, the commodity price uh, start to declining and the current account surplus start uh, change into deficit while the trend of uh, borrowing for SOE increased very fast. So looking at this uh, chart, actually we got the uh, uh, result yeah, that uh, based on of this uh, study, our uh, balance sheets be become vulnerable now. And if we look at the currency composition, uh, we uh, got a lot of uh, net exposure in uh, US dollar and also Japanese yen. While Euro, we have uh, a negative exposure. It's mean more asset in Euro com compared to the, uh, the debt, the liabilities. Uh, based on this uh, result, we, we also has changed our strategy now. We reduce, from a government perspective, we reduce the issuance in Japanese yen and we issue more in euro and, uh, and dollar. Actually, uh, we have a coordination with central bank. Uh, uh, every year we met uh, we met with uh, central bank uh, before issuance plans is launched and also every auction uh, central bank will be represent uh, to give the uh, liquidity perspective i go to the last slide i think the next step uh, after this study, uh, we will uh, improve the study and incorporate uh, the horizon of the, the duration of the uh, FX, yeah? because uh, the duration is very important, uh, like uh, government debt is very long, our average to maturity is around 10 years while for uh, reserve is very short so we cannot match all the all the exposure we uh, we can match the short term one and uh, for the longer one we can uh, do the coordinations uh, to reduce the vulnerabilities and also for soe we uh, we regulate the the borrowing program of soe to uh, to control the growth is very uh, very risky for uh, public balance sheet. I think uh, that's all. Uh, thank you. Well, thanks very much, Harry. I think that's um, a really interesting case, and uh, from what I see around around the world and other countries, quite groundbreaking, and that it's extending the analysis to take account of uh, major state-owned enterprises um, and I can certainly see why given some of the numbers that you shared with us. So at this stage I'd like to uh, open it up to the floor for, for any, any questions, any, any comments for the panel. Well, to, to get the ball rolling, I've got one. <laughs> um, so it's a question for Fatosh. So in the um, Turkey and South Africa case studies, it seemed that most of the work was looking at this, this um, foreign currency versus domestic debt composition issue. So how much uh, attention was paid to the composition of the foreign currency debt versus the foreign currency reserves you know, along the lines of what, what he was talking about? Well, it's a very good <laughs> question indeed. Well, as I said, you know, in Turkey, we don't have specific benchmark for current foreign currency composition because when we look at the, the nature of the foreign uh, currency borrowing, it's uh, our International Capital Markets Division um, issue um, euro bond, bonds uh, based on the market conditions. 
basically. However, uh, we, we guide those um, uh, the borrowings considering the correlation between local currency and major foreign currencies. So what we do is we, we didn't set specific risk targets for front office in terms of foreign currency composition. However, uh, we kind of um, advise them to borrow in a currency that has a strong correlation with Turkish lira, which is um, euro and, Turk um, and, and dollar. And uh, when we look at the current portfolio, it comprises of, of, of mainly, you know, like 70% dollar, 30% um, euro, uh, and, and some Japanese uh, yen denominated that as well. And uh, in, uh, in our current discussion with the, uh, in, in that and risk management committee, uh, we indeed uh, assess this issue, uh, like I uh, which, in which currency we should borrow more or less. And uh, at the end of the, um, the discussion, uh, we, we conclude that uh, we should borrow more in euros because, uh, you know, when we compare to dollar and euro, we have uh, less exposure to a uh, euro. So as, uh, to, in order to balance the composition, uh, we decided to borrow more in euros in, in future. However, as I said, you know, in, in, in international capital markets, uh, they borrow, they issue bonds uh, when the opportunity arises, and they look also the the costs of the, of the bonds. And in, in South African case, I don't know uh, the, the exact um, setup for, in terms of foreign currency composition, uh, but they have a similar um, composition uh, as we have in, in Turkey, mainly in dollar. And uh, I've, uh, I've talked to uh, one of the colleagues in South Africa, and they also said they didn't mimic the, um, the composition of foreign foreign reserves, rather uh, they look at the correlation between the, um, the, the South African um, local currency and, and other currencies as well. It's because uh, when we, um, if, if we, if we uh, use derivatives, it's easier to mimic the foreign, uh, foreign reserves, central banks' foreign reserves. However, uh, like in Turkey, we, we, we don't use derivatives. For, for certain reasons. We, we don't want to take counterpart risk and other stuff, uh, as you can imagine. And uh, so what we do is we try to construct natural hedges. And uh, th so that's why we cannot mimic the uh, foreign currency reserve composition. I hope I can answer. Yeah, thanks. That, that's good. Any, any questions from the floor? Antonio. Can you please use the, the microphones for the questions because we're filming this. Uh, this is uh, for Eve. Is that, I mean, the, the case of Denmark is pretty clear because you have a fixed exchange rate. So, I mean, there is a claim on those reserves that can, but would you, would you, the, your conclusion that this type of framework works better for currency risk than it does for interest rate risk, given the fact that the Treasury and the Central Bank have different objectives, accounting and all that stuff. Would that conclusion change if, uh, if you have a completely flexible uh, exchange rate regime, once and two, um, I think we, we've seen a number of countries uh, where that have been accumulating reserves uh, it's very hard to define what excess reserves are. But then you start listening to, to central bankers saying about these different segments or segments within the reserves. So there, I think the, the conclu your conclusion may, may perhaps be reconsidered again. And the last one, uh, I mean, is the, the other issue that probably we didn't discuss here is the size itself of the balance sheet because there will be countries that could start borrowing to build up reserves, even if, even if not uh, for, to, for the fixed action rate regime. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I don't think that the, I think uh, because we have this fixed exchange rate, it's more easy for us to identify for instance, what is the minimum risk portfolio? It's more easy for us to to really figure out 
uh, what is risk. Uh, so in that sense, we have a, a more easy task. Uh, so that's right. But I think the underlying issue that if you have currency exposure in different parts of the kind of overall government balance sheet, then it makes sense to look at whether that introduces a lot of extra risk or not. Doesn't depend on the currency risk regime. So at least one have to look at, into that if if you make or if one feels that it, it makes sense to to uh, kind of to take some conclusions on 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 that. Uh, but you are also right that that if the size if the if the currency reserves is much larger than the than the government debt, there's a number of kind of. The focus shift to the currency reserve, what is a reasonable composition of that? And there's a number of, of approaches you can get to that. One if, is, of course, as you mentioned, to have different kind of layers to segment the, the currency reserves. But even if the currency reserve is segmented, you have foreign exchange rate risk. It doesn't kind of move away because you segmented it. So in that sense, it makes sense to at least look at the numbers and figure out whether you have a problem or not. I think that's an important thing to go through the steps of, of uh, you know, just consider whether there's an issue or not, or whether it's just a very small issue. If it's a very small issue, there's no reason to, to do anything about that. And one, in principle, one could also say that if there's totally flexible exchange rate regime, why do you build up currency reserves? But that's another issue which is beside this. But it just, to my mind, it doesn't quite fit what you're just saying is that you build up currency reserve because you, in effect, have a currency regime. But that's, that's another issue, I think. Interest rate risk-wise, it's what we found is that it's very, again, just to try to figure out what will happen in different circumstances is very important. For us, it's important to, to understand what's happened if we... Also, it's important for us not just to have a currency reserve that we can match with the liabilities, because currency reserves from time to time will be used, and then the asset will change the nature from a FX asset to a domestic asset. One has to trace through all the different uh, kind of transactions that we are doing in order to figure out whether it's consistent and whether it, in some circumstances, actually increase the risk. Any other questions? Yes, Lars. On the same theme as, as Antonio's question or comment, I think uh, in the Swedish context, we decided Sweden has foreign exchange debt and foreign exchange reserves, but effectively in a flexible exchange rates. And in such an environment, if, if, if assuming that the, the currency depreciates, the central government debt will rise in value, and, and in the EU context, you will get a bigger gross debt. The fact that the, the holdings of the, cent the domestic currency value of, of the central bank's reserves also increase doesn't affect you in any way, specifically in the Swedish case, because the dividends from the central bank aren't affected by the exchange rate losses and gains. So I, in that context, I think the Turkish solution at looking at, at sort of the minim if you if you have a foreign currency debt, minimizing the variability in terms of domestic currency is is the more rational approach. So that in terms of some sort of all overall consolidated uh, perspective, you have not become poorer by the appreciation of your currency. But if the central government sort of, if it doesn't affect the numbers or the, the available assets of, of, the, of the central government, it, it makes more sense to look at the variability, to minimize the variability in the relation to the domestic currency rather than in relation to the foreign exchange reserves. That's at least our, our, our thinking on, on, that, on that issue. There, it depends on on the institutional structure, I think. Thank you. If, if I can just make one point on that. It, of course, there's a question of whether it's paid as dividend or not, but you can also say it's a question of the national wealth. And even and, and if, if you have a large risk by investing in one currency and borrowing in different currencies, that risk will influence, you could call it the national wealth, even though perhaps it doesn't flow through 
dividend to the government. Okay, time for, for one more, then I'll, then I'll wrap up. Okay, yes, sir, on the back. Thank you, sir. Uh, in Turkey, contingent liability is one of component in asset liability management. <coughs> uh, what, what I know, uh, contingent liability is talking about probable or not probable to become the direct liability. So can you explore what the definition of the, what are the criteria of contingent liability can be calculated in the ILM? Thank you for your question. Uh, it's a, I'm glad that you asked this question because uh, we don't uh, directly take uh, contingent liabilities into account when we set our borrowing strategies. We consider um, contingent liabilities when we make other um, risk analysis, like the sustainability analysis and sensitivity analysis. Uh, well, as I mentioned in my presentation, that we move from conventional um, DSA, the, the sustainable analysis, to risk-based uh, the sustainable analysis, and uh, in that framework, um, for for ten years period, uh, we look at the um, the baseline of of debt stock to GDP, and we also um, set scenarios for contingent liabilities. What if, what if, um, like certain percent of contingent liabilities. Um, realize what if we, we need to undertake um, the, the treasury guarantees? What if we need to undertake, a, you know, um, some um, liabilities from PPPs? Because, uh, well, although uh, we have a limited uh, number of of, uh, um, of PPPs and, and treasury guarantees for for the time being, it's uh, it can. Um, and in the future, never know. It's uh, now around it's uh, three percent of GDP, uh, but uh, it may have a big impact on our, our um, borrowing requirement when it realizes. So uh, this is how we consider contingent liabilities when we um, advise uh, our that that uh, policies to to the higher um, committee. Okay, let me, uh, I think we're, we've just come up to just after four o'clock, so time for coffee. Um, I think this was a, a really interesting discussion and um, I won't do a long s summing up, but a, a couple of takeaways for me from the discussion. One is the, the power of information and, and getting the numbers out there, and I think that was very nicely illustrated in the Indonesia case when you do take this broader perspective across the sovereign balance sheet and start sharing numbers across the various entities, uh, then action can happen. And we saw that uh, with uh, uh, Bank Indonesia um, uh, agreeing to, to have a dialogue with the ministry about the information they'd, they'd uncovered. The second big takeaway for, ma for me is whose role is it to do this? And I think the, the contrast between the approaches in Sweden and, and Denmark show that quite nicely. So to the extent that um, governments don't publish fully consolidated balance sheets that show what the, the government's net worth is, then uh, the issue is simply not being measured and, and therefore no one particularly cares about it, uh, given that uh, you know, what gets measured uh, gets managed. So then what, uh, what should be the, the role of debt managers in this? Well, I would argue that as the, the manager of perhaps the largest chunk of the, the consolidated sovereign balance sheet, they have some in incentive to, uh, to take a look at this issue because it, it can inform um, how, how the, the sovereign's overall net wealth is, is being impacted by changes in exchange rates and interest rates. But it's clear that uh, this is an area where a, a lot of work lies ahead uh, and uh, you know, look forward to, to dialogue with you on this in, in the coming period. So I'd like to thank very much uh, my panel for, the, for their hard work to prepare the presentations and sharing them with us today.
uh, and thank you all for your attention.